Hi everyone, this is Leah, your lead course instructor for Advanced eClinical Training, and I want to welcome you to our lecture series, The um, Anatomy and Physiology. Today we are going to be talking about the cardiovascular system, and this is one of my favorite systems. I worked uh, for a long time in a CTICU or a cardiothoracic intensive care unit, so a lot of my patients had um, uh, open heart surgery, They some of them had heart transplants. So um, this is a system that's a uh, body system that's very close to my heart. Now the cardiovascular system consists of three main elements and those include of course the heart. You also have the blood vessels or the vasculature and also the blood. There are four main functions of the cardiovascular system, and that includes um, oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, transport, uh, nutrient and waste product transport, disease protection and healing, and then thermoregulation or temperature control of the body. The heart um, has four, is a four chambered structure, because. Uh, consisting of mostly cardiac tissue. Now the right side of the heart moves deoxygenated blood um, to the lungs, which is pulmonary circulation, and then the left side of the heart moves the oxygenated blood um, back to the rest of the body through the vasculature or the blood vessels, which is also known as systemic circulation. Now there are four main layers of the heart and they include here the pericardium and you can see all of these here in this um, picture to the right and uh, the pericardium is a double wall sac and it is the uh, the outermost layer of the heart in it uh, the pericardium is uh, used to protect and anchor the heart to the rest of the chest cavity you also have the epicardium and this is the visceral and the outermost layer of um, the heart and is actually part of the heart wall. You also have the myocardium and this um, layer consists of thick bundles of cardiac muscle that's kind of like binded and twisted together um, and it's the part of the heart that is contracting. And then you also have the endocardium and this is the innermost layer of the heart that is very thin um, and that lines the chambers of the heart. So here you can see in this picture the chambers of the heart. Um, again, the heart has four chambers and they're divided longitudinally or up and down by the heart septum. Um, and the four chambers include the right atrium and the right atrium receives uh, the systemic blood from the body. The right ventricle, which pumps the blood into the lungs. And then you have the left atrium, which receives the oxygenated blood from the lungs. And then the left ventricle, which then pumps the blood back to the system or the organ systems. The heart also has four valves, which you can see here. I've circled them so you can easily identify where they are. Um, the tricus tricuspid valve is the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. You have the bicuspid valve, otherwise known as the mitral valve. And this is between the left atrium and the left ventricle, which is right here. Um, you have the pulmonary valve, and this is the valve that separates the left ventricle from the aorta, um, which we'll speak about, we'll talk about the aorta here coming up very shortly. And then you have the aortic valve, and this is the valve that separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Here we're talking about the great vessels. Uh, now, the great blood vessels provide a pathway or a roadway for the entire uh, cardiac circulation to run. And these vessels include the superior and the inferior vena cava. So you can see in this picture, superior is up here. The inferior vena cava is down here. So superior meaning above, um, inferior meaning 
below if you're familiar now um, with your anatomic body positions. Um, and this, um, the heart receives the oxygen poor blood from the veins of the body through the large superior inner vena, um, through the large superior and inferior vena cava and pumps it through the pulmonary trunk. And then the uh, pulmonary arteries. Um, so the pulmonary trunk splits into the right and left pulmonary arteries, which carry blood to the lungs, where oxygen is then picked up and then carbon dioxide is unloaded. And the pulmonary veins, so oxygen rich blood drains from the lungs um, and is returned to the left side of the heart through four pulmonary veins. And then the aorta right here, which I said we would talk about, um, blood is then returned to the left side of the heart, pumps out of the heart into the aor aorta from which um, the systemic arteries branch to supply essentially the rest of the, the body tissues. This picture here is um, of just the systemic circulation, which we just talked about, but it just kind of um, visually describes it to you where um, how the blood moves from uh, the vasculature through the heart. So classes of blood vessels. So first we have arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Then you have the arterioles and they're the smallest branches of the arteries. You also have capillaries and capillaries are the smallest of the blood vessels. And this is the location of exchange between blood and the interstitial fluid. You also have venules and the venules collect blood then from the capillaries and then the venules run to the veins, which then return blood back to the heart. The heart also has something called the conduction system of the heart. And this is a network of nodes or group of cells that can be either nerve or muscle tissue. And they're specialized cells um, and electrical signals that keep your heart beating. So there are two types of cells that control your heart. First, you have the conducting cells, which carry electrical signals, and then you have cardiac muscle cells, which controls the heart's contraction. So the conducting cells are what sparks the electrical signals, and then the cardiac muscle cells control the actual um, contraction of the heart, because I'm sure we well know that the heart is a muscle. So the cardiac conduction system sends the signal to start a heartbeat while also sending signals to tell different parts of the heart to relax and contract. So this process of contracting and relaxing controls blood flow through your heart to the rest of your body. So here is a pathway of the conduction cycle that we just talked about that you can see here in this picture. Um, the conduction system occurs uh, systemically through first the SA node, and this is depolarization wave is initiated by um, the sin sinoatrial node. Um, the atrial myocardium, the wave then successfully passes through the atrial myocardium and it goes to the atrial ventricular node, and this is the depolarization wave, uh, then spreads to the AV node, and then the atria contract, and then you have the AV bundle, and then um, passes rapidly through the AV bundle, and then to the bundle branches and per uh, Purkinje fibers. So take some time um, to, to go through each um, one, two, three, four, and five, so you can just see how that cardiac conduction cycle works. Then we have something else called uh, the cardiac cycle. And so in a healthy heart, the atria contract simultaneously. Then as they start to relax, the contraction of the ventricles or the bottom of the heart begins. Um, and this is otherwise known as uh, systole and diastole. So systole um, means heart contraction. Diastole um, means heart relax, heart relaxation. Um, so the cardiac cycle, the term refers to 
uh, the events of one complete heartbeat during which both atria and vent that both the atria and the ventricles contract and then relax. The length of an average heartbeat approximately 70 times per minute, 75 times per minute. So the length of the cardiac cycle is normally 0.8 seconds. Um, the first heart sound that you hear is the lub is caused by the closing of the AV valves or the atrioventricular valves. And then the second heart sound is the dub. So you know the lub dub. So the second heart sound occurs when the semilunar valves close at the end of systole. And again, you can see here in this diagram how that whole cardiac cycle works. So the last component of the cardiovascular system consists of blood. So blood composition, composition is seen here. It's approximately 55% liquid and 45% cells. Um, plasma is the liquid portion of the blood, um, and it's a mixture of nutrients, salts, respiratory gases, hormones, and blood proteins. Um, and then all blood cells can be divided into three categories. You have the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, and the platelets. Here we have the erythrocytes or red blood cells, and these are specialized um, cells designed for oxygen transport. Now they are shaped um, bioconcave, bioconcave um, which you can see here. So bioconcave means um, they're kind of flattened on the inside. And this will help them travel through the capillaries. Um, easier. And mature red blood cells, um, they don't have a nucleus or a mitochondria or other membrane organelles. And so they only have a lifespan of 120 days. And then they must be recycled um, since they cannot divide because they have no nucleus. And then you have the hemoglobin. And this is an iron uh, containing protein that carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then hematocrit is a measure of the proportion of blood that is composed of red blood cells. So you've you know, probably heard by now, you know, uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit. And this is, um, you know, usually this is um, in what we can what we call the complete blood counts um the hemoglobin and the hematocrit is used to uh, is a blood value that's used to identify uh, many different disease processes um and is a measure of um really how healthy you are and we'll talk about that um in another lesson and more in depth you also have leukocytes and the leukocytes are white blood cells White blood cells, they help fight infection and defend the body through um, a process called phagocytosis in which the leukocytes or the white blood cells encapsulate and destroy foreign organisms. Uh, white blood cells also help to produce, transport, and distribute antibodies as part of the immune response to a foreign substance or antigen. And there are five different types of white blood cells. You first have the neutrophils, and they have protect your body from infection by killing bacteria, um, fungi, or fungus, and foreign debris. You also have lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes consist of T cells, which are natural killer cells, and B cells to protect against viral infections and produce proteins to help you fight infection, otherwise known as antibodies. You also have the eosinophils, and these help to identify and destroy parasites, cancer cells, and assist uh, basophils with an allergic uh, reaction response. And then we have the basophils, and this uh, produces an allergic response like coughing, sneezing, or a runny nose. And then you have monocytes, which defend against infection by cleaning up damaged cells. And then last but not least, we have thrombocytes, um, otherwise known as platelets. And platelets um, are small colorless cell fragments in our blood that form clots and stop or prevent bleeding. Platelets are made in our bone marrow 
which is a sponge-like tissue inside of our bones, which we'll talk about more when we talk about the muscular skeletal system. Um, thank you so much for joining me uh, for this lecture series on cardiovascular. If you have any questions or concerns or you need to clear anything up for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. You know you can reach me by email or you can always schedule office hours with me as well with my Calendly um, calendar. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.